Welcome to this Case of the Week presentation by birdultrasound.com.au. My name is Stephen Bird. I'm a sonographer from Adelaide, in South Australia. And the title of this presentation is Whatever You Do, Don't MSU. And MSU stands for Make Stuff Up, or you know what I mean anyway. You can visit uh, birdultrasound.com.au and you can enjoy many more presentations on a wide range of ultrasound topics. And you can also email me at stayintouch at birdultrasound.com.au. The point of this presentation is to highlight just a few, in fact, three quite simple examples of where a sonographer can come unstuck and come to the wrong conclusion. And I'm just going to highlight these as a point of difference so that when you uh, see these in the future, it won't be the first time you see them and you can come to the right conclusion very rapidly and easily. The first thing is this, you might be scanning an abdomen and you come up from that left kidney there and you're coming up to have a look at the spleen and you look behind the spleen and you think, hang on, there's something between the spleen and the diaphragm. Now, if you're scanning a patient that's a post-operative patient or someone in the intensive care unit, this can be really concerning because you might think that they've got some sort of a subphrenic collection and this would be medically very, very important. But what this very commonly is, is simply the liver. And the liver can have a very extended left lobe and it can tuck itself right around behind the spleen, almost giving the spleen a bit of a hug as it goes around. I see this most commonly in female patients, although you can see it in male patients as well. And typically I see this in fairly slender uh, female patients where the left lobe of the liver does seem to have the capacity to get in behind the spleen. I've seen this reported many times as a potential subphrenic collection. I've then seen it be go on and, and the patient be referred to have CT scanning uh, with contrast to assess this, which is simply a waste of medical resources. It's, a, it's a, an ionising radiation dose that's unnecessary and an unnecessary risk having, um, having contrast as well. I've also, would you believe it or not, seen one of these come back and present at our department for an aspiration or pigtail catheter type drainage of this subphrenic collection. And when I have a look at the images, I think, hang on a minute, that's simply the liver in behind the spleen. So this is in the long axis. You can see it here in the long axis as well. And the clue to the diagnosis is the fact that you've got splenic texture, which is in this case a little bit less echogenic than the liver texture. But the liver texture, when you come to it, you can see that it's actually got portal veins and hepatic veins running through it. And it has what you would expect to have with a normal liver architecture. The difference in echogenicity is quite variable because depending on the degree of steatosis, if there's no steatosis in the liver whatsoever, it might be almost isoechoic with the spleen. However, if there's a little bit of steatosis, as with this patient, you can see that the liver is a little bit more echogenic than the spleen. You can see it in the short axis and in the long axis. It's not an artifact, it's a real appearance, but it's simply liver behind the spleen. So here it is in the short axis. And you can see as you come up above that liver, you can see something there. And in the long axis, you can see it ghosting there. Now, sometimes you don't get a really good look at the diaphragm and you just see a little piece of this liver texture here. And that can be a bit of a concern. And especially this is a concern when you've got a patient when you are suspecting a subphrenic collection. So you might have a, a septic patient and you're looking for some sort of a collection reason for their sepsis. And you come up and you have a look down the paracolic gutters. And then you come up and have a look in Morrison's pouch. And then you come and look in that subphrenic space on the left-hand side. And you see this material in there. So it's very important to understand that this is simply liver and not something pathological. To change gears, this is the second case that I'd like to present and I've seen this reported in all sorts of different ways. Now this is an image through the palm of the hand in the short axis and to anatomically get you your bearings here, this is flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus of the index finger and this is flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus of the middle finger. This is the lumbrical muscle here and this is the digital nerves running down between the two fingers here. Now adjacent to the digital nerves you might notice there's all these uh, sort of spherical or oval shaped black structures and in the center of them they have like a little echogenic focus and this is a really characteristic appearance. Now I've seen these reported on several occasions as being neuromas associated with the digital nerve so perhaps the patient presents with trauma to the hand or pain in the finger and then the sonographer will notice these little black areas immediately adjacent they're really close to the nerve and they'll call these neuromas. Another thing I've seen it reported at is little put reported as is thrombosis of the vein sitting along that digital artery and nerve bundle there. It's neither of these things, of course, and in fact this appearance is entirely normal. If you scan the palm of your own hand or anyone's hand, you'll see this appearance very, very commonly. 
what we're actually looking at here are rather curious little structures, and they're called Pacinian corpuscles. Now, the Pacinian corpuscles are little oval-shaped hypoechoic structures sonographically that sit in this uh, in this connective tissue adjacent to the digital nerve in the palm of the hand. And what they look like uh, in a histological sense is concentric rings, many, many concentric rings with a, with a central nidus in the centre. And that central nidus, when you look at them sonographically, explains why they look like they're a hypoechoic round thing with a little white dot right in the middle of them. And they tend to cluster along adjacent to the digital nerve in the palm of the hand. Now, Pacinian corpuscles are actually very important for us. They're part of our sensory system. So the Pacinian corpuscle is approximately oval to cylindrical shaped and about one millimetre in length. And that's very consistent with what the ultrasound finding is. The entire corpuscle is wrapped with layers of connective tissue. And it's, its capsule consists of 20 to 60, 60 concentric lamellae. And that's why we see on that histology picture, why we see it looks like an onion, like little onion rings going round and around and around. And that concentric lamellae is why they've also got the alternate name of a lamella corpuscle. Now, Pacinian corpuscles are receptors and they detect gross pressure changes and very sensitive or minor vibrations in the skin. So they're really important in terms of our neural sensory pattern and it's part of the reason our hands are so sensitive as we make our way through life. So next time you're scanning the palm of a hand and you see that immediately adjacent to the flexor tendon and immediately adjacent to the digital nerves here, you see these little hypoechoic round things. Don't think that these are little ganglions coming from the flexor sheath. Don't call them giant cell tumours arising from the flexor sheath. Don't call them neuromas arriving from the digital nerve. Don't call them a thrombosis. You can not MSU. You can get it absolutely spot on and call them Pacinian corpuscles. The next uh, case that I'd like to present is a case of the pampiniform plexus. Now the pampiniform plexus can get thrombosis, but it's really uncommon. And most times that someone comes to me and says, Steve, I've got a case of pampiniform plexus thrombosis, I say, are you sure that you're not MSU, making stuff up? And they look at me like, hmm, okay, we'd better check and see if we've got the real diagnosis or not here. Because what I find most commonly is that the person doing the scan for the first time has actually discovered the vas, so the vas deferens. And the vas deferens has this unique ultrasound appearance. It is round in shape, it is hypoechoic, it has a thick muscular wall, and in the centre of it, it has a little tiny echogenic donut sitting in the middle of it. And there's a reason for this. Now, the vas deferens is is a tube that needs to propagate or move a small volume of liquid very quickly at just the right point in time. So if you think of it, it's like a ureter, but the ureter can be lazy. It can sort of just slowly move the, the uh, urine from the collecting system of the kidney down into the bladder. There's no rush, just take your time, bring it down, fairly large volumes. And so if you look at a ureter, it has a similar design, but it has a very thin muscular wall and it has a large aperture in the middle. So it can deal with large volumes, but no rush, it'll just slowly peristyles that fluid down into the bladder. Now, the vas deferens is different. It needs to transport sperm, and it needs to transport a very small volume of this liquid, but it needs to transport it very rapidly at just the right point in time. Now, to do that, it needs a small lumen, because that's good for small volumes, and a thick muscle, and that's why it has this appearance. So because it has this appearance of a round structure, that's hypoechoic with a little dot in the middle of it, and it's non-compressible because it's made of muscle, then when you see it in amongst the veins of the pampiniform plexus, like we're seeing on this video here, you can mistake it and think that you've found a thrombosis, especially if the patient has pain in that area, you might jump to the conclusion and say this is a pampiniform plexus thrombosis, where in actual fact, all that you've found for the first time, and congratulations, you've found the VAS. And this is a really important thing to be able to find when you're doing male fertility assessment. It's important with male fertility assessment because you can have an absent vas, you can have a congenital absence. And in that case, it doesn't matter how good the testicle is, it can't deliver the sperm as required, and therefore you're gonna have a male reduced infertility. Now this is a case on the left-hand side where you can see this is a genuine pampiniform plexus thrombosis. And on the right-hand side with the video clip there, you can see it is just a normal vas. And so the normal vas is this structure here. You can see it's got a hypoechoic thick muscular wall and a little tiny dot in the middle and that is the patent lumen that transports the sperm. Now on this side 
we have a structure here that is a genuine 100% correct diagnosis of a pampiniform plexus thrombosis. And the reason I can say that that is the correct diagnosis is twofold. Firstly, this is very large to be a vas, so it wouldn't be a vas if it was this large. And secondly, there is the vas there. The same sort of appearance with that echogenic centre, hypoechoic around the edge, and this is a typical vas. So next time you're going to diagnose pampiniform plexus thrombosis, make sure that you get a picture like this so you show the vas separate to the actual thrombosis event. So this is a video of that same patient. You can see over here, you can see the vas, you can see it moving through here with the little echogenic center in it and the hypoechoic muscular wall. And over here, we've got a genuine pampiniform plexus thrombosis. And isn't it interesting how a pampiniform plexus thrombosis looks like any other superficial thrombosis, really? It just looks very typical. That could be a little varicose vein in the calf with a superficial thrombophlebitis. It would look very, very similar to that. So here it is in the short axis and the long axis. So this is genuine pampiniform plexus thrombosis. And uh, the reason we're sure about this is because we've identified the vas as a separate structure. The vas can also have different appearances that you need to understand. These are not pathological. So you can see the vas in this patient has, again, a thick muscular wall. But in this case, the central lumen of it is really wide. So you can see the central lumen is quite large, and it contains quite a lot of echogenic material. And the reason for that is this person has had a vasectomy. So this is not some sort of a weird collection in the, uh, in the scrotum. This is a normal post-vasectomy vas, so don't mistake it for pathology. If you follow this this vas which is very full of old sperm that can't escape and you follow it until that appearance terminates you'll arrive at this point here see the little ring down artifact there that's the little clip from the vasectomy and above that level so on the bladder side of that level you're not going to see any uh, dilatation of the vas so you're going to see the vas being dilated all the way up to the clip and then once you go proximal to that it's heading up towards the superficial ring to go through the inguinal canal you're going to have what appears to be a normal vas, and there's the little clip, there's the little ring down artifact. So this is simply a, a distended vas that you expect to see post vasectomy. This is another distended vas. Now, in this case, the material in the middle is not uh, echogenic, but it's quite hypoechoic. And in this case, you can actually see a bit of a sperm granuloma here, where around the clip that they've applied, you can see there's a bit of scar tissue and a bit of fibrosis that's formed. So these are all normal appearances for a post vasectomy patient and shouldn't be confused with a pathological appearance of the vas. And then occasionally you're going to see this quite chaotic and I think rather spectacular appearance. And this is when you look at the epididymis or the vas of a patient that's had a vasectomy some years ago. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing lots of sperm that has not been able to escape. So it's trapped in the epididymis, typically in the body of the epididymis is where you'll see this. And the old dead sperm simply clump together. They're all, they're all sort of dead and sort of collapse together and form these little echogenic foci. And they just mull about. So you'll see them just moving around in the little semi tubules inside the epididymis and cause this quite sort of chaotic sort of appearance and you can watch them sort of noodling about. You can see normal flow here and some veins around here. This is just venous flow but this is all old sperm sitting inside the epididymis of a patient that has had a vasectomy and this shouldn't be uh, confused with any sort of pathology. This is an entirely normal post vasectomy appearance that you're going to see from time to time but I think you'll agree it creates a rather interesting and almost amusing at times ultrasound picture. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I hope that you've never been guilty of MSUing in any of those three circumstances and if you haven't come across these findings then most definitely you will not MSU when you see them uh, next come past your transducer and hopefully it'll improve your accurate diagnosis. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. You can see more of my presentations if you visit birdultrasound.com.au and if you'd like to uh, contact me in any way please email me at stayintouch at birdultrasound.com.au Happy scanning and bye for now.